I want to sing very old song. Okay, hello, hello. Thank you for tuning in. This is your New Moon newsletter for the month of Leo 2020, August 18th through September 18th. And today is the 18th of August, recording this just a few hours short of the actual new moon. And there's a lot going on. Can, can you tell, can you uh, sense in your experience of the world that there maybe is a lot going on in the astrology as well to, to reflect the, the reality of the world? Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, and I hope you are staying safe and happy, healthy, hopeful uh, in this uh, transitional moment in history. So uh, glad you're here and let's dive right in. This month I want to uh, talk about the month's energies by looking at some charts. And so hopefully you can see these and, uh, and maybe see me as well. So here we have two charts and this one on the the left this word sankranti means it's the moment that the sun changes signs and so you can see here here's the sun at zero degrees zero minutes of leo and and so this really the sun is like right here right having just come through this this gandanta point which is right between cancer and leo and so it's just entered Leo. And so that is the, the moment of Sankranti. And so this is, this is the chart for Leo Sankranti. And so, so this chart is used to predict the, or, or I, I, like, I don't tend to like to do predictions, uh, but, but the chart is used to describe the energies for the sort of political uh, month. The, you know, so this, is, this chart is cast for, for Denver, Colorado. Uh, still consider it my hometown, even though I haven't been there for a little while. Um, and, and so this is really the political sort of public energy for the month of Leo for the United States. Uh, this, this, it's a more solar chart. On the right here, we see this is the new moon chart, uh, two and a half days later. And, and what's notable about this, we see that we have the sun and the moon uh, at the exact same degree, exact same minute. So this is when the sun and moon are perfectly lined up. This is the moment of the new moon. The new moon chart is used to measure the more internal psycho-emotional quality of the month. And of course, all of this interacts with your individual chart in unique ways just as you know, all these circumstances impact our lives, we all have different roles to play, different uh, struggles, e even though there, so there's the larger struggle and, and the, uh, the issues that we're dealing with that then impact us all in, in individual ways. So, uh, but, but the new moon chart gives us a sense of what the, what the more emotional quality of the month is, what's the interpersonal energetics going to look like. So, so I wanna talk about these two charts a little bit. Uh, very similar and also different in a way. Uh, one of the, the main things, uh, of course, it is Leo season. And, and this is sidereal astrology, as always. Uh, apologies to the Tropical Zodiac fans. Uh, but this is, this is sidereal. And so here we are on the 16th of August, a couple days ago now. The sun moved into Leo. And here is the ascendant right there with it. And, and so this is, this is an interesting astronomical point that this is actually how the, the zodiacal seasons are measured, is that looking at the stars at sunrise, when the sun rises, what stars are in the background? That's, that's really what we're measuring when we're talking about it. it's Leo season, it's Libra season, it's Aries season, whatever it is. Uh, this, this is the actual calculation. What, when the sun rises, what stars are behind it? And, and so here we are. Sun is rising, 
7.42-ish a.m. That's maybe not perfectly accurate for sunrise in Denver, but, but this is the, the moment that it, it fully changed signs. So, so we have uh, the rising sign and the sun sign in Leo. And Leo, represented by the lion, lion is the king of the jungle. There's only one king. There's only one sun at the center of the solar system and around that sun, everything else orbits. So maybe many of us know Leo people in our lives. I feel like uh, Leo people are some of the easiest to peg. Like even if you don't know much about astrology, you can sort of say, oh, I know that that's a Leo person because there's just this like, there's a little bit of bravado often there's this sense of, of nobility. And whether it's earned or not, there is this innate sense of, I am someone special. And I don't have to be doing anything special to be someone special. And you just get this sense like, oh, wow, that, that's someone special there. And, and uh, Leo likes to be center stage. Uh, Leo tends to have no problem having everybody pay attention to them. In fact, that's the preferred state. You know, when court is in session and the king is sitting on his throne, everybody should be quiet unless the king allows them to speak. Everybody is paying attention to the king, taking their cues from him. And please excuse the gender normativity of this. In, uh, in the Vedic tradition, the planets are gendered, right? So, um, the sun is a masculine force, the moon is a feminine force, and uh, Mercury is neutral, Mars is masculine, Venus is feminine, right? So, so we do have these genders assigned to the planets to help us understand the energetics that they, uh, that they emit and, and the way that they move through us. Now, uh, Venus, a uh, sort of feminine energy, has both a masculine and a feminine expression, right? The feminine rulership in Taurus and the masculine through Libra. So, so it's, it's, it's always uh, stacked in that way where it's, it's, a, it's a hologram. Then the whole is contained in each tiny little part and, and you just go down to, through these fractal levels where, where sure, Venus is a, a more feminine energy, but it also rules and it has a masculine expression as well. And it's all just like encoded in the fractal all the way down. That makes sense. Um, so, so when I'm talking about the planets, I tend to talk about them like characters in a play that, that makes the most sense and, and helps us understand. So in this case, the sun is the king. And when the sun is in Leo, the king is on his throne and and that is a comfortable place for the king to be, is in his full power there. As opposed to, for example, uh, if the sun is in, um, let's just say, this is, this is the sign of Aquarius over here. Uh, Aquarius is a very, uh, you know, exactly opposite the, the king in, in the zodiac. It's more about the populace, the population. And, and so Aquarius is more like the king walking through the marketplace, trying to negotiate with the baker for the price of a loaf of, bre of bread. The king is, is not in his element there. That's, that's, that's not where he's in his full strength and, and not totally comfortable. So the same character behaves very differently depending on where they are located or what, what scene they're participating in. So here we have uh, the sun, in Leo, king on the throne. And this month is very much focused on our relationship to power and who is the king at the moment, right? And, and uh, my friend Adam Summer, a, a wonderful Western astrologer, uh, talks about the orange king. And I've sort of borrowed that phrase from a bunch lately. Our, our, the orange king of the United States right now. And it's it makes me smile to say that, but it's not actually very funny. And, and it's all about him right now. And we've got this election going on. So it is, it is about, you know, jostling for who is going to be the king on the throne. And, and this month, there's going to be a lot of action in that realm. Of, of course there is. And, and it, so there is this quality of 
of who is going to demonstrate the most nobility and who is going to have the the qualities of the king that we want to that we want to assign to the throne and and of course there's there's all sorts of um drama in the king's court uh to to keep track of uh one of the things that is true and and has been true for a little while now um where are my notes about that uh mercury is combust is is what i'm looking for and yeah mercury has been combust from the 3rd of august and will be until the 3rd of september and and so you can see mercury is combust anytime it's within 14 degrees of the sun so here's mercury at 28 degrees cancer each sign has 30 degrees so mercury is really just like right here and the sun is really just right here so it's very close so um 28 to zero and it's two degrees away you can see it really clearly here here's the sun here's mercury at three degrees and the sun at two degrees basically right on top of each other and mercury is the planet of like logistics and communications and and the transfer of data and isn't it interesting this attack on the post office is very much an expression of the king on his throne making pronouncements and really just like burning up the our one of our primary systems for communication and and in order to solidify his his power and you're like well i'm the i'm in charge and then whatever i say goes and so uh I, i'm going to you know explode this this uh really like neutral thing right like the post office is a pretty apolitical entity unless you politicize it and and it's you know everybody needs the post office it's it's a fundamental function of a society of a, of a working society and and so to go after that is it it i see it as this combustion where where mercury again mercury has this neutral quality it's not for or against it just wants the information it just wants accurate information delivered quickly so it can process it and that that is if that's not the post office i don't know what is and and it's combust until september 3rd and and really this quality of combustion is uh the example i've offered a few times lately is uh, you know when elmer fudd is hunting bugs bunny and and bugs managed to manage to like stick a carrot in the end of elmer's rifle but elmer doesn't notice and and he pulls the trigger and it sort of explodes in his face and he's sort of like stunned and you know end of scene that's that's sort of the quality of combustion where it it's it's also it can be associated with like heat exhaustion where when it's 115 degrees in the middle of the afternoon you can't do anything you just you just got to take a siesta and and have some watermelon juice and that's about all you can do it's it's it is debilitating in a way and and so that's what happens when planets get too close to the sun they their all of their energy gets zapped and they are not able to express themselves as clearly and forcefully as as they normally would so this this is this touches on one of the main uh, paradoxes of the sun in that it is both sattvic and has a cruel quality to it so sattvic is that it literally gives light right the sun is responsible for all the light and uh, life and heat and warmth everything that gives us life on the planet depends on the sun's warmth and and energy and it is the most reliable thing right the the light of the sun wipes away the you know historically evolutionarily the scary dangerous nighttime and there's we can that's a literal thing every day but it's also a deep metaphor of the light overcoming the darkness and and so this is the sun like the sun is the original object of worship right the from the beginning of time living beings have worshiped the sun from sunflowers who turn in its direction to tama surya namaskar the sun salutations uh the original sun worshiping you know the ra in in ancient india or india egypt um so 
so the sun, object of worship, object, object of, of a giver of life. And if you are stranded in the desert, the thing that is going to kill you is the sun. And the same fire that cooks our food, warms our house, can also burn our skin and burn our house down. And, and so there is this cruel quality. And, and the sun doesn't care <laughs> on some level, right? The sun is going to shine. That's what the sun does. It shines. And how you are able to receive it or transform that energy, that part's up to you. You know, plants do a good job of photosynthesizing unless they can't find enough water, in which case they wither, right? And, and but the sun, that sun, that's not the sun's issue to work out. That's, that's on the plant to, to figure out how to maintain that homeostasis. The sun is going to shine. That's what it does. And it sort of doesn't care whether you're getting burnt or, or lit up by its shining. And its primary motivation is purification. It, it wants to bring light to dark places. That, that's the primary motivation of the sun. And so the hope is that this month, there's a little more leadership from all quarters to illuminate dark places and to have a little more courage and, and a little more uh, consistent clarity of like, hey, I've got my light shining on this and it deserves, it deserves to see the light of day. This information, this um, malfeasance, uh, this idea, it, it can very much be about ideas. And, and so this is a month of, of leadership and who is going to step into leadership roles. Unfortunately, as I see it, the two elderly white men who are applying for the biggest leadership job, neither of them are, are, the type of leader that I am excited about. Uh, there's obviously a preference in there, but it's, it's, it's a tough one, to be honest right now. Neither of them are the type of, like there are so many other amazing people in the world who are such qualified leaders, who have, are visionary and capable and dynamic and adaptable and, and compassionate and intelligent. There's so many glorious, amazing humans. and I think the political scene is a little too toxic to attract those people at the moment. Uh, who would want that job? So, so that's, that's a whole other thing. But you don't have to be running for president to demonstrate leadership. And so, so let's, let's, I want to switch over to, to this other side and, and see that, okay, We all have the opportunity to, to be leaders in our own sphere, right? We all have our own sphere of influence. And so this month on an interpersonal level is about our relationship to power, uh, our, our connection to the sovereign king that lives within us. And, and we can see that. So here's, here's this, all this action happening in Leo. And again, this is, this is the new moon chart. So this is, this is the more psycho-emotional, interpersonal, inward, uh, reflective energy of the month. And our, our rising sign is, is Aquarius, precisely opposite. The, the king is the people, the populace, the population. Um, Aquarius is a very democratic sign, very interested in, in the whole the whole culture, the invisible structures that, that keep us together, the politeness, the, the customs, the, you know, what does it mean to be one of the people and how do we greet each other and, um, and, and how do we share resources equally? Uh, this, this, this opposition is really, really a powerful uh, lesson for us at this time in history is how, how do we demonstrate strong leadership without falling into the patriarchal dominator model. How, how can we be one of the people and our own sovereign within our own sphere? Like I, I want to be the sovereign king of my own existence, of my own body and my own life. And I want to be one among many. I want, I want to be surrounded with uh, camaraderie and connection and I wanna be one of the people. So that's, that's this tension 
this, uh, this polarized opposite of Aquarius and, and Leo. Mm. So it, it, you know, this is a seventh house relationship straight across that is, you know, it's, it's like you and I are, are sitting right across from each other right now in, in a digital plane. And, and so it's the, it, this is a relationship between equals, peers, colleagues. This, this isn't, this isn't a top down thing, you know, teacher, student, parent, child, boss, employee. No, no, no. We're, we're the seventh house relationship is exactly just sitting across the table and, and sometimes we forget this, but really the, the king, the powers that be are this equal and opposite force to the population and the people. And really the people have the greater weight. Uh, we forget that. And, and there are you know, way more of us than there are of them. And, but, but they wield the, the purse strings and a lot of the power. And so there, there's this counterbalancing tension that, that uh, for the most part holds society together. And, and so, so this is happening on the, the larger scale. It's also likely to be happening within us this month where mm, the invitation is to investigate your own relationship to power, your own relationship to who's running the show in your own mind, in your own life, in the, the, uh, in the palace of your mind who are the different characters who occupy that court? Uh, is the king a tyrant or a weakling or does the king rule with benevolence? And what role does the queen play? Does the queen really run the show and the king is just a figurehead? Uh, or you know, maybe the, um, the military advisor is really the one running the show and the king just sort of goes along with what he says. You know, uh, so, so to, to be in this inquiry of what is your relationship to your inner power and then how does that relate to your connections with external uh, power, external authority figures is, you know, the, the king is the ultimate authority figure, the archetypal father. So, so uh, father issues are likely to be up this month and just to check in, uh, first of all, check in with your dad if, if you can. Uh, and and connect and and have this conversation you know there's nothing wrong inherently with a king right when the king is intelligent and benevolent the king the whole kingdom thrives when the king is tyrannical and corrupt then then we we struggle or the, the population struggles and one of the key mechanisms to prevent that tyranny is a smooth line of communication between the king and the people. And, and so again, this, is, this brings up this combust mercury energy. So we wanna be careful, we wanna be careful. And, and it's likely that, you know, mercury has trouble talking when, it, when it's combust. It, it, there's, there's all these thoughts, but it, it's like Elmer Fudd's rifle where there's so much power there, but it sort of goes and, and might blow up in your face. So, so be very mindful. The other thing we wanna be really careful with this month is all these fire signs are are getting activated so here's sagittarius down here um here is aries up here mars has just gone into aries um let me move my square okay um and then we have the, all this action in leo okay I really just want to move my squares where I want to move them. And sometimes it works better than others. Yeah, there we go. That's close enough, don't you think? Okay, these are the three fire signs of Zodiac. And Mars has just crossed this Gandanta point from Pisces into Aries. And here we have K2. K2 always moves in retrograde motion. So it's at one degree. K2 is right here about to cross this Gandanta point into Scorpio. And we have the moon, sun, and Mercury who have just crossed this Gandanta point from Cancer into Leo. Uh, if that word Gandanta is unfamiliar to you, uh, it's, it basically means a, it's a karmic knot. It, it happens everywhere a water sign meets a fire sign in the zodiac. And, and so it, there are, these are the only three places where uh, two signs meet each other and and two 
nakshatras, the finer divisions also meet. So there's, there's almost like this trench, but it, it, um, hmm. yeah, it, there's, uh, I would talk a lot more about this in the most recent uh, Jyotish of now with Cultivate Balance. So there's a link to that in, in the New Moon newsletter. Check it out. There's, we, we go in, in depth about that topic. So I want to keep going here. So, so these Gandanta points are all active and, and the fire signs are really kicking in. And it's the dog days of summer. You know, it's August. It's hot. And, and the fire signs are, are most active. And we see these, these form a trine. And, and that word try, trine, uh, has the implications of a triangle, doesn't it? And, and so these, these signs have a, a dharmic relationship with one another. Okay, come on, come on. I would like to just use my tools the way they work. Okay, just like that. I am at about a fourth grade art level. So thank you for bearing with me here. Um, so, so yeah, this, these, these signs uh, have, have a, this, this dharmic relationship. And, and you can see that this, the same energy is present over here. Um, you know, the, these things, these are mostly in place. You know, Mercury just within the, this two days will, will join uh, the sun in Leo. And, and so this same structure exists on, on this side. And, and so here on the Sankranti chart, it's, it is a dharmic relationship. These are, this is house one, five, and nine. These are the, the dharma houses, which uh, on the personal, social, and universal level. So this, this is really about who is, who is the righteous leader? Who, who has the nobility and, and this sort of divine righteousness to truly lead the people? And, and we've got some big decisions to make about that and and we may be willing to fight about it mars in aries is ready to take action it's our warrior who's been so peacefully in the writing poetry in the pisces garden up here uh sitting by the ocean you know singing songs uh but now that the warrior has moved into aries and he's going to turn around and go back soon but uh there's this itchiness for action and impulse and wanting to fight for what's right and and you know, down here in Sagittarius, we've got uh, Jupiter retrograde questioning our teachers, questioning our beliefs, uh, questioning what is really true, what is really valuable. Uh, and, and K2 in this Gandanta point, uh, wanting to uproot uh, dysfunctional systems, wanting to get in there and dig up the whole garden, clear the slate so we can plant some new things. So, so that's, that's this really, in, in, out in the world, we, this, this can be a guidepost for us is to pay attention to who feels like they are speaking from a place of conviction and true righteousness. And, and what, what activates that sense in you of like, wow, yes, that is an idea worth fighting for. And, and oh, I want to go onto the metaphorical battlefield for that concept, for that, for that idea. Um, that, that's, that, the, you know, the Dharma houses want to connect us to higher truths, capital T truths, the awareness with the awareness that everything is impermanent. Everybody I know is going to pass away. Uh, everything I know is going to change. And below that, the substratum of that, there, there does exist, uh, a real permanent reality and and how what concepts ideas practices actions activities connect me to that capital t truth that true reality that underlies the constant change of the observable material realm that's that's what these dharma houses want so so be watching out for that in the in the outer world here on the new moon chart uh this is this is the third house, this is the seventh house, and this is the 11th house. So on that interpersonal level, more likely to be uh, fighting for egoic desires, um, 
the third house is is where we differentiate ourselves as humans. It, it really is is the ego. And and so there's this quality of Mars third house Aries that's a little bit like I want what I want and I'm gonna fight to get specifically what I want. And it's not a there's no benevolent cause to it. It's this impulsive. It reminds me of myself as a teenager ultimately, where I was willing to do whatever it took just to do whatever I wanted. And even if it was a stupid idea, I was like, I was just gonna burn my way through it. And if you try to, you know, try to get my way, you might get burnt. Uh, so so there's that sort of quality to us. We want to be really mindful of this Mars and Aries. Uh, it, it's, it has an explosive energy to it. Uh, it's a, you know, Mars rules, Aries, fire planet, fire sign, uh, it, and, and this impulsive quality, the spark into life. Now, it can also be the source of some great discipline and strength. I talked about this in, uh, on the Sunday Night Live just last night, uh, two nights ago where these these shifts into the fire signs i've been feeling this renewed vigor and desire to uh, exercise and and lift weights and run and do physical activity and feel strong in my body that that's a very mars and aries sort of energy and so so that's that's a that to me feels like a healthy expression of that sort of like yeah i'm gonna go do what i want and and um that's a productive way to discharge what could potentially be uh, a quite destructive energy. And, and so, you know, explosions can be the most creative thing possible. Uh, they can also be the most destructive thing possible. I made a few notes about that in the newsletter if you're reading. Um, so, okay, three, seven is uh, relationship. And, and again, this mercury combust energy, we just want to be really careful with our language, especially if we're, you know, fighting for our egoic desires and our communication skills are a little bit sharp or have more fire in them than they normally would. Uh, that that's that could be potentially harmful to uh, a love relationship. You want to be really gentle with with your loved ones this month and. And, you know, there is an opportunity for courage. You know, these fire signs have a lot to do with courage. And so you can be courageous and talk about things, go places where you might not otherwise go, but oh, just be so gentle, be so careful. Uh, might be good to do some journaling before you go into one of those conversations. So you can be choosing your words very carefully. And then down here, the 11th house is about our reward and the, like what feels like the biggest reward. What's the greatest paycheck we could ever receive, whether that's money or love or admiration, whatever it is, it's really where we're receiving our, our highest reward. And that is in a space of confusion right now. Jupiter retrograde Sagittarius is questioning our teachers, questioning what do I actually want what I say I want? Do I actually want what I've been fighting for? Uh, and and K2 is is ready to uproot all that, it's ready to blow the whole thing up and and throw the whole thing out and you know, quit your job, break up your relationship, and leave the country as soon as you can. You know, that that's K2's vibe right now. And and so again, we want to be really careful with this impulsive Mars energy to be mindful of maybe you don't need to blow the whole thing up, but maybe it's just a shift in attitude or maybe it's, it's a shift in habit or, you know, it's a, it's a minor thing that can represent a major change. Now, for some of you, maybe it really does mean this lineage I've been studying is uh, misleading me and I, I need to, to find a new teacher. Uh, or um, this relationship is really not serving me and we're fighting all the time, or it's, it's just not aligned. And so I need to cultivate the courage to break out of it. Totally possible. Again, it, this all relates to your individual chart in a unique way. Uh, but I would just offer the, the plea, uh, you know, as someone who tends to operate with a certain dramatic flair, I know all too well the pitfalls of that of feeling like I need to do something drastic and big and, and, and yeah, dramatic. And very often just little changes can make a huge difference in how you experience yourself on a day-to-day -day basis. So 
Um, yeah. You know, it's a totally different game talking to you with the charts in front of me. I, I, these videos are normally only uh, 20, 25 minutes max, and we're already almost at 45 minutes. So I'm going to, I'm going to um, bring it to a close here. And with the invitation to reach out, if you'd like to look at your own chart in this, in this wild time and, and get a sense of uh, how you can make the most of it. And, and, you know, a crisis is always an opportunity, right? And, and depending on how we, you know, the, the wave either smashes us against the floor of the ocean or we surf it all the way into shore. And, and there's a lot of options in between on that spectrum. So uh, I, hope, I hope that you're, you're taking care of yourself, taking care of your community um, and, and trust you're doing the best you can. Uh, one thing that I want to make sure to say is that it is clear at this point that we are in the midst of the turning of the age. In my awareness for the past decade at least, and potentially going all the way back to the 60s, there's been this palpable sense within a certain you know, new age community that there's a shift occurring, that there's some major transformation ready to happen on this planet and and you know people are talking about the event or the happening or the the shift you know, capital s shift um and for me it seems beyond a doubt now that we are deep in the midst of it we're no longer on the precipice of it it's it's happening all around us and through us and the there's no going back so that, that is that's sort of the starting place is having left, there's no way to, to get back to the point from which we left, leapt, right? Um, we are skydiving now and, and we um, were in it. And so maybe the surfing is a better metaphor. You know, we've caught the wave, it's rolling, we're headed towards shore. And how skillful are we with our surfboard to navigate away from the rocks towards, towards the barrel and, and towards, you know, um, the soft sandy landing. So uh, I'm with you in that. And, and that's, that's really the only thing I, I know to say about it. I mean, I, I can obviously say so many other things, but I, I just have this palpable sense that it's a very sacred time on the planet. It, it is a birthing process and, and a birth is chaotic and terrifying and a life or death moment for everyone involved. And, and so it's, but it's also very precious and sacred time and it deserves honoring and it's due respect. Like, obviously respecting the beings, but also respecting the process as its own living entity and, and to do our best to be awake to that larger, grander scale shift that is occurring again around us, but also through us. We are the vehicles for the, the transformation of this planet, which is a paradise planet if we let it. If, if we learn to be stewards and, and skillful associates helping out the, the natural world, we, we can, we have the capacity, the technology, the know-how, the cooperative impulse to live on a paradise planet. And Buckminster Fuller is saying, is famous for saying, the world is now far too dangerous for anything less than utopia. And his vision was for a world that works for 100% of the people, no exceptions. And, and we can do that. We have enough food, we have, enough, we have the resources, there's not an overpopulation problem, we have a resource distribution problem. And, and if we can get ourselves organized, if we can make our way through this birthing process, there is a very, very beautiful world available to us. Uh, and there's, we're in, in the chaos of the birthing canal right now. And, and, um, so, so I just, I mostly just want to say that I'm, I'm there with you and, uh, happy to be connected again. Like if you, 
even if you just want to chat, you know, sign up for a free consultation and, and let's just hang out and talk. Uh, you know, that's, that's my primary uh, motivation in, in, in this work is to be connected with people and, and uh, offer whatever support I'm able to. And, and I get a lot out of, out of my sessions uh, as well. And, and so um, I'm here with you. Thank you for being here with me. And I will look forward to seeing you uh, in about two weeks uh, doing the full moon feature these days and uh, live on Instagram every Sunday afternoon. And uh, there will be another The Joe Tish of Now with the lovely team at Cultivate Balance. I think that's uh, September 5th, the Saturday. So look out for all that. There's links in the New Moon newsletter. And until next time, <laughs> uh, many blessings from Portugal. All the best. See you soon. <laughs>